Vampires. These bloodthirsty creatures have captivated audiences via various films, books, television shows, and stage productions for many years. Thus, it's no surprise that vampires have been present at Universal Orlando's Halloween Horror Nights since the event's early days. Of course, Dracula has appeared several times throughout the years, most recently in 2022's Universal Monsters Legends Collide House. But Halloween Horror Nights has also presented guests with original vampire stories that are just as compelling and horrifying as their inspirations. 2023's event will feature the Vamp 69 Summer of Blood Scare Zone. Here, this year's icon, Dr. Oddfellow, will unleash a vicious vampire horde upon attendees of a New York music festival. But did you know that this specific horde has connections to other houses and scare zones from Horror Nights past? In this deep dive episode, I'll be discussing how the Vampire Brood's blood bond has spanned nearly 20 years worth of attractions at Halloween Horror Nights. I'll also talk about how Dr. Oddfellow maneuvered his way into the Brood in his quest to gain power and immortality, and how that'll manifest at this year's event. I'm Katie, your ghost hostess with the mostess, and this is Vampire Origins of Blood. Before we begin, it's important to acknowledge the different vampire broods we've seen at the event. For example, there are the Cantina Demons residing in Terra Corentis' Blood Thunder Alley, and the vampire brood lurking within Cary, Ohio's 19 Hemingway Lane. I initially wanted to make this episode about all the vampires seen at Halloween Horror Nights, but that would have made this deep dive way too long. Perhaps in the future I'll explore some of those other vampire broods. If you've been listening to Ghostly Swoosh for a while, then you know I have a soft spot for Hive. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and I mean a lot, so let's go back to where it all started. Castle Vampire. In 2004, Halloween Horror Nights 14 featured the event's first original house to be completely devoted to vampires. That house, of course, was Castle Vampire. The house took place in a gothic castle rumored to be the blood shrine to a formidable vampire race shrouded in mystery. In addition to storing various talismans and ornamentations from the brood's different vampire houses, Castle Vampire was where faithful members of the brood gathered every 13 years to renew their vows toward the power fueling their thirst for immortality. They did this by sacrificing unsuspecting victims and feeding from them. The story of one unsuspecting victim's plight was detailed in Shady Brook Rest Home and Sanitarium's patient records, which were accessible on the Halloween Horror Nights 14 website. On October 13, 2002, a female college student was invited to the Taunu Alpha Sororities Initiation Ceremony. The pledge invitation stated that the ceremony's location would be unknown until the ceremony began at night, and requested that the student bring a rose, a black candle, and a small bottle of virgin root wine with her. Meeting the driver at the steps of Taunu Alpha Sorority House, the student was driven to a desolate castle vampire. None of the other Tau sisters had arrived. The student left one of her friends several desperate voicemails, but no one showed up to the castle or answered her calls.
some theories have been made regarding this incident. One suggests the student didn't survive the attack, and her friend, consumed with guilt, was committed to Shadybrook. Another theory claims that the student did in fact survive the attack and was committed to Shadybrook shortly after, traumatized by her experience at Castle Vampire. The incident didn't scare people off from venturing to the castle themselves, though. In Castle Vampire's Q video, an unidentified man entered the castle and briefly explained its history to the camera. This, this castle, it, it owns this history. It has pieces of all these different uh, um, incidents and, and mysteries and, and occurrences. Well, every 13 years, as I mentioned, there's this whole phenomena that goes on in this place. And there was an incident. We have the tape. Uh, once again, it's not in the best quality. I'll let you make it your own mind about this. Did you hear it? Well, let's keep going. Maybe I'm just making. So there it is. That's the video. So what do you think? The Castle Vampire House was located in Soundstage 23, the first time the soundstage had been used for Halloween Horror Nights in eight years, and was known as one of the lengthiest and largest houses featured at the event. Inside the house, guests toured through the castle's various rooms, such as the foyer, the dining room, a bedroom, the library, and the disco room. Yeah, this was the early 2000s, so I'm not going to question that. Castle Vampire also had two staircases that guests climbed on, one to go upstairs to the attic scene, and another to go downstairs to the house's finale, as well as an alternate route for disabled guests. Castle Vampire was one of the most popular houses of Halloween Horror Nights 14. One review even mentioned the house receiving significantly longer waits than some of the other houses, even later into the night. Fans praised the house's set design and flying vampire effects, and at the end of the event, Castle Vampire's success led to the house winning House of the Year. In 2006, the Halloween Horror Night Sweet 16 lineup consisted of spin-offs to popular past houses and scare zones. The event website's archives and collections drawers revealed that Dr. Albert Kane, the caretaker, became fascinated by the vampire brood while he and the other icons chose who to invite to the event Sweet 16 celebration. In a note, Dr. Kane wrote, Bring the children of the night forward and set them free in the blood masquerade. And that's precisely what happened. Kessel Vampire received a direct sequel in the form of a scare zone, Blood Masquerade. Located in the former Shrek Alley, guests became the prey of ferocious vampires vanquishing their thirst for blooded immortality. Several vampire brides and priestesses lurked in the scare zone, oftentimes making meals out of unsuspecting victims. This zone also featured bungee performers that would fly toward guests. The Vampire Brood Chronicles continued the following year at Halloween Horror Night 17. After the events of Castle Vampire and Blood Masquerade, some of the brood descended from the castle and fled to other cities in an act of rebellion. These vampires used nightclubs and lured victims with text message invitations to raves. One of these nightclubs, The Garden, was the setting of the Vampire Blood Bath House. The house had a special backstory page on the Carnival of Carnage website. On the desk of an office overlooking the Garden nightclub was a letter written by a vampire named Johann Engelhardt to his master Elthor Amandis, the most revered and ancient vampire of the brood. Exalted and eldest ancient, two years it has been since the ancient did bid me recover all the reckless ones at the last gathering in the Great Hall of Castle Vampire. I vowed I would deliver ancient judgment upon them. I have tracked and traced them over many continent seas, following a trail of wanton carnage that threatens the very existence of the ancient kind. The reckless have seduced and slaughtered the youth of the uninitiated, and now, if they are not dealt with, it is only a matter of seasons before the watchers become keen to their activities and of us. The reckless are journeying to major cities, finding abandoned industrial warehouses and holding celebration there called raves. The reckless are using what is known as text messages, instant letters and pictures, as invitations to spread the word about the coming raves. I extracted the location of the next rave. I am now observing the rave location from across an alleyway. 
and it is just as predicted and depicted in the drawings set forth that our ancient prophecies told. This I swear, the rebellion will soon be at an end. Ever your most devoted servant, Johann Engelhardt. Also on the desk was a cell phone with two text messages inviting someone named Lindsay to the vampire's rave. Here, let me try to read this. Lindsay, sup, girlfriend? Are you on your way? I'm at rave at garden. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't understand this at all. So honest question for any millennials that are listening to this. Is this how you guys really texted each other back then? Um, because I, I can't understand any of this. This is, this is hurting my head. The Vampire Bloodbath House was located in Narzerman's and would be the last house in that location. The house weaved guests through various areas of the garden nightclub such as the dance floor, the kitchen, and a love shack where two female vampires transformed their male victim. At the end of the house, guests entered a massive warehouse where they were confronted by a humanoid bat creature. Vampire Bloodbath received mixed reviews from guests. Most reviews mentioned the house's enticing atmosphere and characters but short length. Recently, the house has been integrated into this year's backstory. Although featured briefly, the Garden Nightclub played an important role in one vampire's curiosity about Dr. Oddfellow. We'll get to that in a moment. It wouldn't be until 2016 when a new original vampire story was presented at Halloween Horror Nights. Vamp 55 brought guests to Hollywood High School's 1955 Homecoming Parade. Various vampiric school students and staff members roamed through this scare zone, along with vampire greasers and teary homecoming princesses. The short story, Getting Ready for the Party, which was published on the Discover Universal blog in 2020, provides more of Vamp 55's backstory. Shades, one of the vampire greasers, tells the story to two of his record shop's customers 30 years after the attack. As the sun began to set and the homecoming parade commenced, a motorcycle gang of vampire greasers caused the parade to stop at a standstill. The only person to confront the greasers was an ice cream man. After offering the lead greaser a strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream man was instead bitten by the lead greaser. Everyone at the parade tried to escape, but the greasers followed them on their motorcycles and eventually turned them all into vampires. After Shades tells his story about the homecoming parade, David, one of Shade's customers, is surrounded by the other record shop patrons, all of whom turn out to be vampires. Before biting David, Shades reveals the Vamp's plans for a New Year's Eve party, and that party was featured in 2018's Vamp 85 New Year's Eve Scare Zone. Whereas Vamp 55 was set in Hollywood, and appropriately located in the Hollywood area of Universal Studios, Florida, Vamp 85 was set in New York and was located in the corresponding area of the park. Set to an 80s soundtrack, this zone featured fanged punks and big-haired bloodsuckers alike, along with vampiric versions of 80s celebrities such as Michael Jackson. Human partygoers scurried the streets, while news anchor Trisha White and her cameraman Mike reported on the chaos spreading through the city. The zone even featured a show with vampire dancers and a New Year's Eve ball drop. Now we get to this year and how all these vampire stories connect. When the full HHN 32 lineup was revealed in late July, the Discover Universal podcast released a new installment of the Halloween Horror Nights Haunted Tales series. The episode, which ties in with the Dr. Oddfellow's collection of horror scare zone, is narrated by Casilla, a member of the vampire brood who is slowly succumbing to Dr. Oddfellow's spell. In her last moments of free will, Casilla writes to Henrik, a fellow vampire. She shares some of her revelations about Dr. Oddfellow with Henrik and leaves drops of her blood which contain some of her memories. Casilla writes of her obsession with Olato, one of the oldest and most powerful vampires, perhaps related to Elthor Amandus, the exalted and eldest ancient vampire Johann Engelhardt wrote to. In 1939, Casilla traveled to the American prairie seeking to join Olato and his horde, but struggled to locate them. After hearing a report about a mass slaughter at a circus, Casilla traveled to the circus, believing the attack was the work of Olato and his horde. Instead, Casilla noticed that the attack's gruesome aftermath replicated Zodiac-inspired imagery. Casilla didn't find out who was responsible for the attack then, but recently, she has deduced that Dr. Oddfellow carried out the massacre. Then, in 1961, Casilla met a vampire by the name of Erlo Wolf. Erlo told Casilla that in 1938, he worked as a clown in a traveling circus. Olato and his horde attacked the circus in the middle of the night, and only when he woke up did Erlo realize he'd been turned into a vampire. Believing his story, Casilla urged Erlo to speak before the Vampire Council in New York. 
Henrik and Casilla witnessed Erlo telling his story to the council. And much to their surprise, Olado corroborated Erlo's story and confirmed his involvement in the attack. Throughout the next couple of years, Casilla shared anecdotes about Olato to Erlo. One particular anecdote she told Erlo is that Olato enjoyed challenges and was known for holding down one victim while feeding off another. Casilla revealed that she witnessed one of Olato's attacks in 1955. Yeah, does that sound familiar? It looks like Olato had some involvement with the Hollywood High School homecoming parade attack. In 1968, Erlo retold his story at the Regional Vampire Council. This time, Casilla noticed a key difference in Erlo's story. Erlo mentioned Casilla's anecdote about Olato's feeding habits in an attempt to defy the older vampire. Although he doesn't notice the change in Erlo's story, Olato warned Erlo not to cross him, but also admired his passion and promised that the brood would feed soon. Shortly before 1969, Henrik left the brood, possibly sensing Erlo's manipulation of Olato. Erlo's speech inspired Olato to unleash the brood upon upstate New York's Music Fest 69. This was the last time the brood saw Erlo and Olato alive. In the present, Casilla speculates that this was when Erlo abducted Olato and sacrificed him to the Dark Zodiac, needing his blood to gain more power and immortality. Several decades later, in 2007, the vampire brood learned about a different kind of immortal, Jack the Clown. Casilla returned to New York to deal with vampires using a nightclub to draw in victims, the Garden Nightclub from Vampire Bloodbath. Yep, coming back to that. When Jack visited the club, he told Casilla about his history with Dr. Oddfellow, which I'm pretty sure you know if you're engaging with this episode. He informed her that he murdered Dr. Oddfellow and took his cane of souls. Casilla sensed a sinister energy emanating from the cane, a feeling she recalled when she watched Erlo defy Olato. She describes the sensation as the open mouth of a cave, or fangs closing in around her. As time passed, Casilla's curiosity about Dr. Oddfellow grew, as did Oddfellow's influence on her mind. Her intrigue lasted for several years, even up until now. Casilla's recent research on Dr. Oddfellow led her to a startling realization about her former vampire companion, Erlo Wolf that he was Dr. Oddfellow all along. Dr. Oddfellow has the ability to shapeshift as whatever he pleases, including a vampire. This is how he was able to infiltrate upon the vampire brood, speak to the vampire council, and eventually murder Olato to gain more power. Dr. Oddfellow's ultimate plan is to use the blood of the vampires to extend his powers beyond what the Dark Zodiac bestows upon him. Casilla is one of his pawns. At the end of her letter, Casilla mentions losing her strength and has realized that Dr. Oddfellow will decide her end. All her power now belongs to him. So, to summarize the Vampire Brood's story and how everything connects, in ancient times, the Vampire Brood is formed, possibly with the involvement of Elthor Amandus, the exalted and eldest ancient vampire. Centuries later, Castle Vampire becomes the Brood's blood shrine. Every 13 years, the most faithful gather at the castle to renew their vows. In 1938, Erlo Wolf, Dr. Oddfellow in disguise, claims to have been attacked by Olato and his horde at the traveling circus. Olato confirms his involvement. In 1939, Casilla travels to the American prairie searching for Olato and his horde. She stumbles across the aftermath of Oddfellow's sacrifice. In 1955, some of the vampire brood, the Greasers, attack Hollywood High School's homecoming parade. Casilla is a witness. In 1961, Erlo and Casilla meet. Confused, Erlo tells the story of becoming a vampire to Casilla. Casilla urges Erlo to speak to the council. In 1968, Erlo defies Olato at the Regional Vampire Council and changes his story to manipulate the older vampire. In 1969, the brood are unleashed upon New York's Music Fest 69. Erlo and Olato go missing, and Erlo, really Dr. Oddfellow, sacrifices Olato's blood for power. In 1984, Shades, one of the vampire greasers, tells the story of the homecoming parade attack to one of his customers. He later turns him into a vampire. In 1984, heading into 1985, some of the brood are unleashed upon a New Year's Eve party in New York. Who exactly unleashes them is currently unknown. In 2002, the Tau sisters, some of the brood, lure a college student to Castle Vampire. It's unknown if the student survives being attacked. In 2006, as the icons pilfer through the archives, Dr. Albert Kane suggests releasing the brood outdoors to celebrate their blood masquerade. In 2007, some of the brood descend from the castle and open nightclubs around the world. Jack the Clown meets Casilla at the Garden Nightclub in Greenwich, New York. 
In 2023, writing to Henrik, Casilla shares revelations and memories before succumbing to Dr. Oddfellow's power. Although the connections are small and some are slightly questionable, the threads can be woven to illustrate the story of a powerful vampire lineage. The brood may be slowly falling to disgrace at the hands of Dr. Oddfellow, but the blood of the Covenant continues to endure. Perhaps we'll see some of the brood stand up to Dr. Oddfellow in another act of rebellion. And what about Henrik? Will he receive Casilla's letter? How will he respond to his daughter's downfall? There are still so many theories to pose, but for now, we'll have to satiate our thirst for answers with what we've been given so far, and reflect upon the memories of the vampires reigning over the night. Thanks for listening to the Ghostly Swoosh podcast. If you'd like to support me and my podcast, why don't you consider buying me a cup of coffee? Go to ko-fi.com slash the usherette. You can also follow Ghostly Swoosh at its new Twitter account at Ghost Swoosh Pod and my socials at the usherette 19 on Twitter and the usherette on Instagram and TikTok. That'll do it for today's episode. See you, everyone. <laughs>